All right. Well, thank you very much, Eric, for that kind introduction. And uh, I had kind of thought, you know, when I took the position as NHGRI scientific director, that I was coming in in era two. And it only <laughs> became evident about three weeks later, after October 10th, 2010, when there was uh, the uh, famous Tea Party election, that things were much different uh, for us than, uh, than what I had originally anticipated. But in any case, it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a challenge. It's really been uh, uh, something that has uh, made us think a lot about our priorities. And I hope that over the course of the next uh, few minutes, we can talk at least a little bit about that. Just to give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about uh, this afternoon, uh, we'll start out just with uh, some general things with regard to the intramural research and in the in the NHGRI, a little bit of its history, some of its uh, current accomplishments, and then uh, I'll at least give you uh, an overview of the vision statement that Eric alluded to. Uh, we'll then get into the nuts and bolts of the intramural program, at least uh, a little bit, uh, talking about space, personnel, and funding. Uh, and then finally, we'll settle on the challenges and opportunities, uh, the two major ones of which are maintaining the scientific excellence of the program and uh, uh, having an equitable way of allocating resources, particularly in constrained budgets. So in any case, just to get started uh, with this, uh, the history of the NHGRI intramural program, as uh, Eric uh, said, uh, it was established in 1993. Uh, by Francis Collins upon his recruitment as director of the then uh, National Center for Human Genome Research. And Francis, I understand, actually did uh, really want to have an intramural program. And uh, part of the reason for that was to have it do something that was a little bit different uh, from the extramural activities of the Institute. So the extramural uh, activities of the Institute were focused very much on developing the infrastructure uh, for the Human Genome Project, whereas the intent for the intramural program was to capitalize on the unique resources of the NIH intramural environment to establish a world-class program in genetics, genomics, and genomic medicine, and secondly, uh, to catalyze a genomic transformation of the intramural programs of the other NIH institutes. And at that time, I was actually in NIAMS, the National Institute for Arthritis, Musculoskeletal, and Skin Diseases, doing positional cloning uh, in a different institute. And we really did look uh, to uh, NHGRI, or uh, NCHGR, as it was uh, called uh, at that time, uh, as really a catalytic force uh, that would enable a lot of uh, uh, research directions that otherwise were uh, challenging uh, in the intramural program. Certainly with regard to the unique resources of the NIH intramural environment, the one that is uh, uh, most noteworthy, I suppose, is the NIH Clinical Center. Uh, at the time that N uh, uh, NCHGR uh, established its intramural program, uh, the building was just uh, this part of it, uh, this new uh, hospital complex uh, was opened in 2005, I think it is. Uh, but in any case, uh, it is uh, the world's uh, largest hospital uh, dedicated just uh, to research. Uh, it currently has uh, 234 beds, I guess it is. All patients who are admitted to the hospital are admitted on a research uh, protocol. Uh, and it really does afford all kinds of opportunities uh, for one to do uh, various clinical and translational and observational uh, projects. And so it is an enormous uh, advantage uh, to be an intramural investigator uh, with uh, the availability of the clinical center. Other distinctive features of intramural NIH uh, include an institutional commitment to researchers over projects, a quadrennial heavy, heavily retrospective review, uh, which then enables uh, perhaps uh, long-term studies that require stable funding. Uh, and high-risk, high-reward projects that would be difficult to do uh, in an R01-funded uh, uh, environment. Um, in terms of catalyzing the genomic transformation of the intramural NIH in the 1990s, I think it's fair to say that uh, the Institute, the intramural program, had an enormous impact. And I've just listed some of the uh, projects on this slide uh, and uh, the uh, institutes that were involved. Uh, these are, for the most part, projects that were initiated by people in the other institutes, but that 
drew upon some of the resources and the expertise uh, that was brought to campus by the, uh, the Genome Institute. And so, for example, uh, the uh, identification of ALPS, autoimmune lymphoproliferative disease in NIAID, uh, the identification uh, by Marsden Linehan of various kidney cancer genes, uh, endocrine, ne endocrine neoplasia genes in uh, NIDDK, tumor suppressor genes by Constantine Stratakis and child health and so forth. Uh, so that it really did, uh, the Institute had an enormous impact more broadly uh, in the 1990s. And another example of this uh, was Jeff Trent's uh, pioneering work uh, with regard to uh, microarray uh, gene expression uh, technology. Uh, currently, there's a lot that's going on in the uh, intramural program of uh, the Genome Institute. And certainly, I don't have time. Uh, Eric uh, did not uh, give me the three hours that I had asked for uh, to talk to you. Uh, uh, we were going to send out for pizza even, but uh, so I'll just uh, list a few of the high points of uh, some of the things that have been going on uh, in the intramural program in the recent past, uh, such as Ellen Sadransky's work uh, showing uh, that Gaucher mutations are very important uh, predisposing factors for Parkinson's disease. Bill Gall and the uh, Undiagnosed Disease Program uh, and uh, the recent New England Journal paper on uh, a genetic form of arterial calcification, as well as a Nature Genetics paper on gray platelet syndrome. Max Munke has been doing genetics of holoprosencephaly and re really is a world leader in that field. Les Biesecker finding somatic uh, AKT1 mutations in Proteus syndrome. Francis, of course, uh, with his work on uh, progeria. Laura Elnitsky, one of our tenure track investigators who's played a prominent role uh, in the ENCODE uh, uh, publications that came out in Nature uh, just uh, a week or so ago. Paul Liu, our deputy scientific director, who's had a couple of papers in the Cell family of journals over the last year. Chuck Venditti, another tenure tracker uh, who studies methylmalonic aciduria uh, and had a paper in Nature Genetics. And it's only two slides, so don't worry, I'm not going to go on to the tenth or whatever. But anyway, uh, I think that many of you know of Elaine Ostrander's work on canine genetics, which has really led to a number of science papers uh, published in the last several years. Yardena Samuels, uh, who's actually taking a uh, tenured position at the Weizmann Institute uh, uh, in a few months, uh, has been a leader in whole exome sequencing in melanoma. Julie Segre had a paper published in Science Translational Medicine uh, a week or two ago on uh, bacterial whole genome sequencing uh, to track nosocomial infections. Jim Mulliken, the head of our sequencing center, has had a couple of science papers in the last year or so on the Neanderthal genome and deep sequencing of HIV-1 neutralizing antibodies. Charles Rotimi had a New England Journal paper within the last few months on uh, genetic susceptibility to podoconiosis. Pam Schwartzberg, a real expert in T-cell signaling and the immunologic synapse. Ingze Yang, who's had a couple of uh, Nature uh, Family Journal uh, articles on skeletal development. And uh, I'll just add my own lab, uh, which had a New England Journal paper on PLC gamma 2 uh, signaling uh, and uh, uh, immune dysregulation, and we have another paper that uh, will probably come out in Nature later this uh, fall on signaling the inflammasome. So there's a lot that's going on in the intramural program. There's a lot more than what I said, but this is just to give you some sense uh, that it's really a vibrant and exciting place, and a lot of really good science is going on. Uh, this uh, uh, slide, in addition to uh, illustrating some of the uh, 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 title pages of some of these articles is also a testimony to, to the slowness of a PC rather than a Mac on which this talk was uh, uh, composed. But uh, in any case, uh, you can see uh, the, the evidence for yourselves. Uh, so in any event, um, and when this is done, we can move on to, uh, <laughs> to the rest of the talk. Uh, I think there's only <laughs> Here it is. That's the end of that one. So uh, in any event, and then you know, talking about the effect of the intramural program on the broader intramural program of uh, the NIH, I don't think that there is any doubt uh, that it continues to have really an enormous impact, much greater uh, than the percentage of the budget that, uh, uh, that we are. And we're, I think, around 3% overall of the uh, intramural budget of the NIH, but certainly we have a much bigger footprint, uh, whether it be with regard to uh, being the, uh, uh, the 
expert source of uh, sequencing on campus or the development of the uh, Center for Chemical Genomics or the Trans uh, NIH RNAi screening facility or CIDR, the Center for In Inherited Disease Research, which I think Bob actually was uh, uh, the uh, founding father of uh, a few years ago. Uh, these are all things that have had uh, broad impact on investigators on, in a number of other institutes. We do a lot of uh, education, uh, the current topics in genome analysis uh, had 1,200 or rather uh, 1,500 enrollees uh, uh, in 2012 and we have it on YouTube so there's a lot of uh, views of it. Uh, the medical genetics and genetic counselors training program also have a big impact. The UDP, I think you've already heard uh, at least a little bit about that. It's had an enormous impact that is now spreading through the common fund uh, extramurally. Uh, we have been a major supporter of a large uh, zebrafish facility and developing libraries of retroviral and ENU mutagenized fish. Uh, we have a gene therapy consortium that we uh, lead and also Charles Rotimi's uh, Center for Research on Genomics and Global Health. So there's a lot of things that uh, we've been doing. Uh, one of the uh, things in terms of just where we're going uh, with things, uh, the Blue Ribbon Panel did uh, very wisely ask us to come up with uh, a vision statement, which we did. And uh, actually, the vision statement is in the materials, as Eric uh, told you. I've just excerpted a few uh, items uh, from the vision statement to give you a flavor for it. Certainly, the overarching goal, as I've already said, is to lead the way on the NIH campus with innovative research into the genetics, genomics, path pathophysiology, and treatment of human disease, leading to a deeper understanding of human biology. We certainly have a commitment to excellence as an abiding principle. We recognize the synergies among basic research, clinical investigation, and social and behavioral uh, implications. Uh, we want to capitalize on the things that are important in the intramural environment, whether it be the specialized uh, resources or the colleagues that we have uh, as uh, collaborators. And we are committed to catalyze genetics and genomics across the NIH campus. And uh, we are committed to make use of the rigorous external review and advice of the Board of Scientific Counselors and uh, NHGRI Council uh, to help us with our decisions. Uh, we had four areas of emphasis that we uh, enumerated uh, in the vision statement, uh, the first of uh, them being uh, developing and implementing state-of-the-art genomics technologies and analytic tools and disseminating across the research community. The second that deals with clinical and translational research, taking advantage of the availability of the clinical center. Thirdly, uh, advancing at least in specialized uh, in, in chosen areas, uh, uh, studies in uh, basic science, and then fourthly, our commitment to uh, training uh, in the field. Uh, in terms of where are we going, uh, the last paragraph of the uh, vision statement deals with that, and we point out that we have uh, built a very uh, uh, integrated program of uh, genomic technology, clinical investigation, and basic science, and what we see is our our uh, goal for the next 10 years is really to exploit these opportunities and to set uh, an example for others in terms of how to do it and how to bring together uh, technology and clinical uh, investigation and basic science. Uh, and certainly in terms of this, uh, I'm sure now, uh, uh, very familiar heat map, uh, we see the role of the intramural program as being primarily uh, in the middle three uh, domains, uh, understanding uh, uh, the biology of genomes, understanding uh, the biology of disease, and advancing the science of medicine. Certainly, uh, the um, understanding of the structure of the genome has been more uh, the domain of uh, the extramural program. And certainly, uh, in terms of the uh, practice of medicine, perhaps just because of the differences in the way medicine is practiced at the clinical center, uh, we're not the ones uh, necessarily to be taking the lead uh, in that uh, area. In terms of the nuts and bolts of the uh, intramural program, at least uh, as of this year, uh, we uh, are spread out uh, across the campus. We're actually in seven different buildings on campus and a couple of buildings uh, off campus. Uh, the uh, personnel are uh, broken down, the scientific personnel are broken down into seven different branches uh, illustrated on this slide. Altogether, we have 45 uh, investigators uh, in the uh, intramural program. 
Uh, of them, uh, 23 are tenured senior investigators, six of them are tenure track investigators, and then we have 16 associate investigators that are sort of uh, like the uh, research uh, faculty uh, at a uh, academic medical center. We also have nine adjunct investigators who are actually in other institutes but have a special collaborative relationship uh, with uh, our institute. Uh, this slide uh, just shows uh, the photos of the uh, uh, individuals who are our faculty members. Uh, altogether, our personnel uh, census is about uh, 520 uh, individuals uh, uh, in the intramural program currently. Uh, in addition to having the various research laboratories, we have eight different cores uh, shown on this slide. We have the NIH Intramural Sequencing Center, uh, which is basically a mid-sized genome sequencing center that provides next-gen sequencing and sequence analysis. Its total budget is about $7 million out of a $104 million total budget for the intramural program. Jim Mulliken uh, is the director. There's a staff of about 36. They have three uh, HiSeq 2000 machines, as well as uh, several other uh, sequencers, and they really uh, have uh, been extremely collaborative uh, with intramural investigators being involved in a lot of uh, disease uh, gene uh, investigations. Uh, the Undiagnosed Disease Program, I think you've already heard about, but just uh, briefly to summarize, it's a trans-NIH intramural uh, initiative established in 2008 by Bill Gall, who is our clinical director. Uh, and sees patients with seemingly inexplicable conditions referred from throughout the country. Uh, and they do comprehensive clinical and molecular analyses of these patients that are accepted into the program. They've discovered uh, a number of heretofore unknown molecular lesions defining new genetic diseases and have been a catalyst for follow-up projects in the categorical institutes. In terms of funding, Eric has already told you a little bit about that, you know, about the time that Eric uh, took uh, uh, the position as scientific director, things flattened out, uh, and then I uh, assumed uh, the scientific director uh, position here. And actually, uh, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, uh, the, uh, the real dollars that we have to, to deal with are perhaps uh, at this point uh, becoming a bit more constrained just because of the fact that there have been a number of things that we've tried to do to keep things going, but uh, there's just so much, and with inflation, it's becoming harder and harder to keep everything going at the uh, juggernaut pace that we would like it to uh, continue. Uh, overall, uh, the uh, NHGRI is 1.7 percent of, of the NIH budget. Uh, we are 3.1 percent of the overall intramural budget. That's because of the fact uh, that we do uh, receive 20 percent of the uh, overall resources, uh, budgetary resources of the institute, whereas many of the other uh, institutes have only 10 percent allocated to their intramural programs. Now, one can have a discussion about that, and I know that the Blue Ribbon Panel uh, thought deeply about that question as to whether that is still appropriate, and I will let them uh, weigh in on that. But certainly one of the reasons that we have adduced uh, for why perhaps uh, NHGRI uh, should have a higher percentage is that it really is catalytic for the other institutes. As uh, my experience when I was in NIAMS, uh, we we're not necessarily catalyzing arthritis research or whatever uh, in NHGRI, whereas NHGRI certainly was catalyzing some of the things that we were doing in NIAMS. Uh, and that's uh, with no disrespect meant to uh, my uh, uh, other, uh, my former institute, of which I'm still very fond. Uh, in any case, in terms of our overall intramural fun funding, uh, we spend about 30 percent of our budget on NIH infrastructure about 16 percent on our own uh, institute-specific infrastructure, 44 percent on personnel, and 10 percent uh, that goes for operating and discretionary funds. And so that actually is a very telling figure, because if we did have to make uh, major cuts in the upcoming fiscal year, which is at least a possibility, we hope uh, not a probability, but at least a possibility, uh, one has to consider the fact that to turn on a dime to actually be able to uh, adjust the budget uh, relatively quickly without having a little bit of time to adjust infrastructure spending and uh, reduce the personnel lines, that becomes very difficult to do. 
Um, in terms of our challenges and opportunities, uh, first of all, maintaining scientific excellence. This is an area that I think is extremely important. And the standards that we uh, have discussed uh, in the intramural program that we should, that we feel are important and that uh, our investigators should be held to are, uh, does the work fundamentally change the way we think about or understand relevant areas of biomedical science? Through the development of new methods, does it change the way that we do science? For clinical research, does it change the way we practice medicine? Whether clinical or basic, how would the field look if the intramural investigator had not been active for the last five years? And uh, is the research worth studying with the special resources associated with the IRP? These are high standards, but I think that we have to uh, hold our investigators to high standards, particularly uh, in this time of constrained resources, because we may have to make some difficult choices. Uh, to help us with those choices, uh, listed here is the NHGRI Board of Scientific Counselors, a group of nine uh, distinguished uh, investigators from outside of the uh, intramural program who help us to uh, do the quadrennial reviews of the uh, various investigators in the program. Uh, and um, over the course of the last, uh, I guess, uh, six months or so, uh, we have developed uh, some new standards, some new approaches in terms of the review process. Uh, we've implemented a more standardized format uh, that is about 50% retrospective and 50% prospective. We have additional ad hoc reviewers with the reviews to make sure that we have a lot of expertise in the subject matter that uh, the investigator is working on. Uh, we do uh, an orientation with the reviewers in advance to articulate our expectations to them. Uh, we use now NIH-wide standard criteria for reviews. The reviews are supposed to be done before the site visit uh, and finalized uh, shortly thereafter. And we use a set of um, uh, standardized descriptors that are used across the intramural program now. Outstanding, excellent, very good, good, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, this will give us a way of comparing investigators from one uh, branch to another with regard to the quality of their work and help me to make uh, decisions if I have to with regard to resource allocation. And certainly for uh, investigators that have less than an excellent evaluation, we do have uh, a process in place where at least initially they have to undergo a re-review uh, one year and two years after their initial uh, not so good review. Uh, and if things continue to be uh, 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 less than optimal, then uh, there are processes in place actually to uh, reduce their resources and even close their laboratories. Um, in terms of allocating resources, uh, the big picture is that the overall IRP allocation has been flat uh, for several years and using the forbidden word that I didn't realize was forbidden, uh, uh, sequestration may impose an 8% and about 8% cut for FY13, perhaps. And we, the problem, of course, is we won't even know it. The fiscal year begins in three weeks, and we won't know if this uh, actually will happen until at least three months from now. Uh, overhead costs, salary increases, and inflation have eroded buying power. Options to raise monies from non-federal sources are extremely limited in the intramural program because of ethics uh, rules that I'm sure some of you are now uh, uh, initiated into uh, through your uh, service on the council. Political gridlock begets budgetary uncertainty. In other words, we don't know what the budget's going to be next year, so it's a problem in terms of making commitments for large-scale allocations of monies. Since I became the scientific director on 10-10-10, uh, we've implemented about 15% across the board cuts for all tenured uh, intramural investigators, comparing the proposed FY13 budgets that uh, investigators are getting versus the FY10 budget that they had before I came. Um, and uh, we have suspended three uh, tenure track recruitments for budgetary reasons and have made no major capital equipment purchases in the last two years. So those are the facts. Um, uh, we have implemented a new budgetary model for our investigators, uh, and that is that uh, in the past we had a formulaic uh, system of allocating budgets where if an investigator at a certain 
uh, sort of point in his or her career, had a certain number of people in their lab. The salaries of those people were taken care of centrally by the office of the scientific director, uh, and then uh, they would get an allocation based on the number of people in their labs. Because of the fact that we are making these cuts and that it really gives people perhaps a little bit more freedom to make decisions as to how they spend their money, they're now getting a lump sum allocation, and at least within uh, the law, in terms of civil service requirements and so forth, they can spend the money as they choose in terms of personnel versus uh, uh, supplies and equipment. Uh, allocations, at least initially, are being determined by historical factors, in other words, what people were getting last year. But subsequently, they'll be adjusted based on productivity and excellence with strong input from the BSC. Uh, we're going to try to reestablish a centralized reserve fund for compelling opportunities and, and or contingencies. And this last year, actually, uh, the investigators were very good about saving money, which we are now, uh, as much as we can, uh, channeling into contracts that will perhaps uh, buffer any uh, budgetary cuts that we experience uh, next fiscal year. Uh, we have established a review panel to allocate subsidized sequencing resources at NISC. And uh, this whole new approach uh, has required new accounting measures and a change in the culture among both our investigators and our administrators. So anyway, to summarize uh, this uh, cheery uh, talk, uh, first of all, the NHGRI uh, IRP is a vibrant research enterprise, and I really do believe that. And I am extremely uh, proud of it and positive about it and, and uh, uh, do feel that it's, it's a wonderful uh, uh, opportunity to be its scientific director uh, with a commitment to excellence and a focus on genomic medicine and fostering genetic and genomic technologies throughout the NIH intramural community. The IRP has recently strengthened its quadrennial scientific review process to reinforce this culture of excellence going forward. And finally, prompted by the current limitations and uncertainties of federal funding, the IRP is implementing administrative changes aimed at maximizing productivity within budgetary constraints. And that's 30 minutes, exactly, which for me is quite a feat. Um, <laughs> So actually, Dan, let me um, have you address a question that got raised earlier that I deflected or delayed until you were here, is maybe just say a few words about uh, the clinical center, which you introduced us to, but um, uh, the, the question, and Bob, you can weigh in to get more specific, just sort of what's the health and well-being of the clinical center with respect to, you know, how much it's being utilized relative to its capacity, but also there's been lots discussed, debated, and even written about sort of the financial woes of the clinical center with the rising costs of medical care in general and being embedded within the intramural program, flat budgets, everything else, and so sort of what's its fiscal situation? Yes. Okay, so first of all, with regard to the utilization of the clinical center, uh, about maybe five or six years ago, there was concern that it seemed that uh, intramural investigators weren't uh, utilizing the clinical center as much as they should be, and the occupancy uh, of the hospital was more in the uh, 65 to 70 percent level than uh, uh, more in the 80 to 90 percent level that we would like to have seen. Uh, but basically, uh, a number of the institutes responded to that by uh, uh, encouraging clinical and translational research within their intramural portfolios uh, with regard to recruiting uh, more uh, clinical and translational investigators. And so actually, at this point, the utilization of the clinical center is, is very good and, and uh, is more in the 80% uh, level uh, uh, most of the time. Uh, as far as the uh, funding stability of the clinical center, well, I can tell you it's not rolling in dough. There's no question about that. The clinical center is funded for the most part by uh, a so-called school tax, uh, which is a tax on each of the uh, institutes that uh, has a program uh, on the Bethesda campus that currently amounts to, I think it's about 14 percent of our overall intramural budget. So that means that for us in NHGRI, who have an intramural budget of around a hundred million dollars, we pay about 14 million dollars to the clinical center. Off the top, 
doesn't matter how many patients we use, uh, it's just $14 million that goes straight to the clinical center. And the whole idea behind that was that it would encourage uh, the institutes to utilize the clinical center if they were paying this amount of money, whether they used it or not. And so, you know, the idea was that, well, uh, if you're going to be paying that amount of money, you may as well at least have a program that uses it. Uh, so uh, the current budget for the clinical center is around, I think, $380 million a year, somewhere in that uh, ballpark, uh, that is basically raised through these uh, school tax uh, monies. Um, it has been difficult for the clinical center because of the fact that uh, medical inflation is going up higher than the rate that they are uh, getting money through the school tax. Because after all, if the budgets of the intramural programs of the institutes are flat that, and your tax rate is flat, then you're going to be getting the same amount every year. And if there's medical inflation, then you know you're not, you're going to fall behind. And so that has been a problem. Uh, the, uh, clinical center has dealt with that in several different ways. One of them uh, has been to shift the cost of some of the clinical research back to the institutes so that, for example, certain things that had been paid for by the clinical center in the past are now the responsibility of the participating institute. That certainly has been uh, one of the uh, ways that that's been done. ERA funding did help out uh, with some major capital uh, equipment purchases back a couple of years ago, scanners and that sort of thing. So that has helped. Uh, and then there's also uh, uh, the possibility that the uh, clinical center will get at least some additional resources <coughs> based on the fact that uh, the uh, clinical center is being opened to investigators in the extramural world through a new grant uh, mechanism that would allow extramural investigators to collaborate with intramural investigators uh, with regard to certain kinds of projects and might, for example, collaborate with regard to cohorts of patients with rare diseases that we follow uh, uh, in the intramural program. And so that may, uh, through uh, mechanisms that haven't been totally worked out, uh, allow for a little bit of uh, supplementation of the clinical center budget as well, if it is regarded as being uh, sort of a resource for everyone, not just the intramural program. Bob, does that answer your question? Yeah, it, it does, but I thought then it might be worthwhile for you to also to talk a little bit about staffing, um, uh, physician staffing in the clinical center in terms of uh, who, are, who are these folks? Do they all, uh, are they all investigators in institutes? Um, and the reason I'm asking this is that I've had some experience with the undiagnosed diseases program where there is some skewing as to which kinds of patients are chosen to be investigated to some extent depending on what are the perceived strengths and weaknesses in various subspecialties within the clinical center. Yeah, that's an extremely good point, Bob. So um, the staffing of the clinical center, it is not uh, like a big general hospital or whatever where you would have uh, necessarily uh, expertise going, uh, you know, totally across the uh, uh, the medical spectrum. Certainly there is sufficient competence that I don't feel uncomfortable when I admit a patient to the clinical center that if they have a certain thing go wrong with them that, uh, you know, we're in trouble or whatever. But on the other hand, it is certainly the case. The clinical center is staffed uh, by a combination of physicians that are uh, 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 faculty members in the various uh, participating institutes. Uh, and so they vary in terms, you know, some institutes uh, uh, invest more money in their clinical programs than others. And so you do have this kind of uneven strength uh, across the clinical center where some specialties are very well uh, represented uh, and others uh, not so well at all. And then there are some physicians that, are, that work for the clinical center that are people that, say, staff the radiology department uh, and so forth. So it's, it's a mixture of things and uh, it isn't the case that it's, it's uh, uniformly uh, uh, excellent across the board. There are some areas of great strength and that can be on very rare diseases and then other areas that uh, might be more common diseases where, you know, we don't have anyone necessarily that's a, a world's expert. And I might add some of those issues have come up in discussions around nationalizing 
the UDP that perhaps when they set up a network of extramural centers, some of those centers might have domain expertise that would both complement the clinical center but also complement each other, and that maybe certain types of cases would naturally get referred to those play, those sites that have the greatest expertise for a patient like that. I ask but one more question, which is, what is the current situation at the in intramural NIH for? clinical trials that involve next generation sequencing or whole exome or whole genome sequencing in terms of CLIA approved laboratory results and that kind of thing. What, what, what are you doing about that? Well, that's another important uh, issue and uh, each of the institutes actually is having to pay for it on their own, you know, so it's, it's basically uh, a uh, patchwork uh, quilt of, of different uh, approaches to that. There is not right now, although there's been discussion of it, but there is not right now a clinical center, CLIA-approved lab uh, that does that for everyone. It would be great if we could get together and do it, but uh, right now, given budgets, I don't see that happening in the next year or two anyway. Any other general questions for Dan? Okay, if not, Dan's not going anywhere, He'll, and, but, but Rick is going to come up. and. Um, give a, a report from the Blue Ribbon Panel review, and as we know, David Page is also on the phone. I expect he's going to also have some things to say as well. 